had more than 3,000 people through this building yesterday, would you believe? More than 3,000 people come and register to vote in yesterday, so. Sold lots of sausages and the coffee shop was running hot and uh, it was just great. I, was, I was, thought they were all just getting here early for Sunday. I was very tempted to send the offering around, but anyway, uh, it was, it was a, uh, a great day. Great, great opportunity to serve our community and uh, yeah, hey, we got a couple of things. Next, next week, um, we've actually got a working bee happening. Don't you just love working bees? We live for working bees, don't we? We very rarely have them, but uh, when we do, we try and make, make it good use. We understand time is precious and particularly Saturdays. Uh, but next Saturday, uh, just from 8 till 12, we're going to do a working bee. And we just want to tidy this place up. So we got, we're going to be mulching gardens and gardening and cleaning and painting. It's just thing, numbers of things we need to do. And so we'd just love people to turn up. We'll have everything ready to go. And, uh, but if we could just have uh, manpower on the ground, woman power on the ground, um, just numbers of things. We get used to seeing things, don't we, when we, we, get, we get tired eyes. We get used to seeing things as they are and want to make sure. And even just having a day like yesterday... Uh, you just realise that there's some things that we need to get on top of and just present ourselves. Our, our, after all, for a lot of people, that's, that's a big part of what they see. And uh, so we want to do that next Saturday morning. So if you could be, make yourself some, some time available for that, that'd be great. And uh, listen, just great. Isn't it great seeing the place packed? Isn't it great seeing the place packed? It really is. And uh, I, I just want to encourage you, we want to, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more in my message, but just to help to create a great environment uh, on Sunday mornings when we gather. You know, one of the things that we often remember, when, when you talk to someone who has had a God encounter, they often can't remember what was preached, they often can't remember half the stuff they went on, but they remember how it felt. They remember what they experienced, and that's a part of what we do as a church, we want to create an environment and a part of that is, you know, having the place ready to go on Sunday morning and people work hard preparing and whatever. And then uh, if we see ourselves as just kind of like as observers and not participators, the fact is you are so much a part of creating an atmosphere here on Sunday morning. In fact, that we are the church. We, we are the worship team. They are not the worship team. We are. Who believes that this morning? And they, they lead us, but we worship. And so a part of that is being here, uh, you know, I always used to say, uh, 8.45 for a 9 o'clock start, and I think we need to bring that saying back, but just the best as we can to try and fill a place so we're ready to go and uh, make create a great atmosphere on Sunday mornings. What do you say? So, thank you. Well, today, as Nikki mentioned, um, the season leading up to Easter is traditionally known as Lent, and uh, if, if you grew up in a traditional church background, you'd be familiar with that term. Uh, it's, it's not a term used so much in our church culture. Um, but just like uh, Advent is the season of preparation for Christmas, Lent is the season of preparation for Easter. And just to give you a little bit of understanding, Lent, Lent is an um, old English word where we get the word Lenten from, which is, basically means spring. And in the Northern Hemisphere, of course, they're moving into the spring season. And that's when the days lengthen and new life starts to spring forth. And so it's, it's for Lent for Christians, was it's a time where we anticipate the victory of the light and the life of Christ over the darkness of sin and death. And we start to think about that and contemplate that. And just like we prepare ourselves for big events in our life, my son got married recently. Good to have you back, Geordie, by the way, this morning. And uh, Naomi. Um, and uh, I tell you, there's a lot of preparation that went on before that big day. And just like we prepare ourselves for our, in our personal lives for big events, uh, Lent is traditionally, it's a season where we make our hearts ready, where we make our hearts ready for remembering Jesus' death and resurrection. And so we've just called this couple of the next few weeks, we've just called it, gone with the good old-fashioned name Lent. And so I thought today, and instead of waiting till Easter, quite often we don't talk about the cross and a lot, of, a lot of things that pertain particularly to Easter, we often don't talk about them till Easter. And so today I want to, to make preparation for, as part of preparing ourselves for this Easter season. Um, I felt one of the best ways I would like to start this series this morning was to actually start to talk about Easter. And to start to get our hearts to move in that direction and get our hearts ready. And so, 
That's my intention this morning. And I want to focus on a particular picture today to help us focus our thoughts and our mind around this coming Easter period. And it's a picture of Jesus, a particular phrase that, that is often used when it was when, when in, in context of Jesus, and it creates a picture in our mind. And that is the picture of Jesus, the Lamb of God. Jesus, the Lamb of God. And it's the most used title given to Jesus throughout the Bible. Um, there's lots of different titles given to Jesus. Uh, but this is the most commonly used. It's used 104 times and it's about a quarter of those are in Revelation where, where Jesus is referred to as the Lamb. And worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. And so it's a, a theme that we are familiar with. It's a name that we're familiar with, but it's rich in what it means to us. And, and so it's, Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God. In fact, one of the most poignant moments was when John the Baptist, we read it in, in John chapter 1, verse 29, where Jesus work, walks through the crowd towards John the Baptist, and John the Baptist sees him, and, and he sees Jesus coming towards him. He says, look, the, what does he call him? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And those present, those who heard John say that, knew exactly what he meant. Because they, they knew that, that John was identifying Jesus as the, what's called the Passover lamb. And, or, in other words, the sacrificial lamb. And Paul in Corinthians refers to Jesus as that. He says in Corinthians 5, 7, he says, um, he says for Christ our Passover lamb, Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. And so, for those of you who may not know, I want to take just a few moments and explain what the whole idea of Jesus as the Lamb means, but in the context of Jesus, the Passover Lamb. So what is Passover all about? So I'm going to pray before we go any further. Father, this is holy ground today. Lord, we're moving towards an amazing time of the year where we remember your death, burial and your resurrection. And Father, I pray that as we move towards this Easter season, that our hearts and our minds would be attuned and prepared as we consider our, 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 our own lives and as we consider the very center of what we build our life around. And so Jesus, this morning, I pray as we open this whole thought of you, the Lamb of God, that our eyes would be open, that we would have a fresh understanding, something that's old would become new again to us today. I ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. So, the Passover. The Passover, well, it has an amazing backstory, and we're not going to go into it in any detail, but basically, Egypt, had, uh, sorry, Israel, uh, God's people, the Israelites, had become in, enslaved by the nation of Egypt, and they had been held slaves for hundreds of years. And then a, a man by the name of Moses, um, who was a Hebrew child, um, was adopted into Pharaoh's family and raised as a son of Pharaoh, if you like. Um, he then he, he is raised up by God to deliver and set his people, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, free from the land of Egypt, out of bondage and out of slavery. And so it leads to um, Moses having a face-off with Pharaoh. Come on, we've, most of us have seen the movie, right? Um, Cecil B. DeMille's, isn't it? Uh, the old one. And, 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 you know, who was Moses? That was uh, Charlton Heston, that's right, facing off against Yule Bruner, wasn't it? Was he the Pharaoh? Have I got that right? And, uh, uh, but but it's, it's this whole story of, of Moses having a, having a confrontation with Pharaoh about, let my people go. And, of course, Pharaoh's response was no. And uh, so, eventually... Um, God, who, who had given the, who'd commissioned Moses, um, had said, if, if Pharaoh doesn't let go plagues, I'm going to let loose plagues on the nation of Egypt. And so there's an ensuing nine plagues. And uh, I mean, there, you know, the water turned into blood and the plague of frogs and uh, of boils and uh, darkness and all kinds of plagues until finally, and of course, Pharaoh continually hardened his heart, said, no, 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 no. And eventually, 
there was the final plague. Can anybody tell me what the final plague was? It was the death of the firstborn child. That an angel of death would sweep across the land and take the, the life of the firstborn child in every household. Um, but there was salvation offered. Salvation was offered. And the salvation offered was, was if they took a lamb, if they took a, a lamb and they sacrificed that lamb and then they took the blood from that lamb and then they put it on the outline, on the, on the frame of their door. If they put the blood of that lamb over their door, well, when the angel of death moved through the nation that night, wherever it came to a house that had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of their house, the angel of death would what? Would pass over the house and the life of the child, the firstborn child, whether it was a child or whether it was a, a grown adult, the life of the firstborn would be saved. And so that was called the Passover. So, um, so for many, for some 1,400 years since that had happened, and that course, that, that led to uh, Pharaoh letting the children of Israel go from Egypt, and they went and that started the whole journey of towards the Promised Land. But a part of their life from then on was for some 1,400 years, they had celebrated this Passover with a meal. And they would once again, they would do the lamb thing. They would, they would, they would sacrifice the lamb and they would eat the lamb and they would, they would drink wine, which represented the blood of the lamb. And they would have this meal, this Passover meal. And it was in an, an environment such as that, that Jesus is sitting with his disciples leading up to the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. And in Luke chapter 22 and verse 14, here's what Jesus says. He says, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this what? Passover with you before I suffer. Verse 16, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds, everyone say, fulfillment. Fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And the fulfillment there is the most important phrase because Jesus was saying that I am actually the fulfillment of the sacrificial lamb. I am going to become the sacrificial lamb. The lamb was a picture. The, the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb, right back there in Exodus, was a picture of what was to come. And Jesus was the fulfillment of that picture. And he's basically saying, I am the last and final lamb. And so this morning, with the time left that we have, I want to do what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus and he said, he described him as the Lamb of God. He said, behold the Lamb of God. Behold means to know, to be aware, to consider, to perceive and understand. This morning, I want us to behold the Lamb of God. And I want us to understand a little the, the, the picture that was painted back in Exodus, I want us to understand the picture of what that means to you and I today. So we're going to go back and we're going to look in the book of Exodus and we're going to see what the Lamb of God means to us today, what Jesus the Lamb means to us today. So firstly, if we go back to the book of Exodus and we go back to chapter, chapter 12 and uh, verse... I didn't give it to you. Verse 3. No, it's the wrong verse, sorry. My apologies. I'll soon find it. We go to verse... Ah. Verse 5. If you can find it, I'll read it to you. It said, The animal you choose must be year-old males without defect. And you may take them from the sheep or the goats. So here's the first thing. that The lamb that they used had to be absolutely perfect. It had to be blemish free. And that's the first thing we need to understand about the lamb. It had to be without defect. In the book of Malachi, it talks about the people used to, you know, God judges the nation of Israel because they were bringing their offerings of, of sacrifice, the lambs that they would bring, and they were blind, and they were crippled, and they had disease. Um, and, and he's going, you know, they are unworthy offerings. Uh, because the lamb that they had to bring for the Passover lamb had to be absolutely perfect. It had to be close to perfect as possible it could possibly be. Why is that? 
Well, there's a simple reason why. You cannot clean something with something that's unclean. You can only clean something with something that's clean. How many know when you clean a window, you don't go and get a dirty old, oily old rag out of the out of the garage that you've been used to sort of, you know, wipe the dipstick of your car when you change the oil. Remember those days when we did that? Um, uh, you know what I'm saying? You don't go get an old cloth and try and clean up something dirty with something dirty. Am I right? Only, only the clean can make something unclean clean. And only the perfect can make something that is imperfect perfect. So that's the first reason why the lamb had to be absolutely perfect. And so I, I'm so glad that when, you know, when Jesus was born, uh, when he come to earth, he, he what, didn't come as a fully grown man and then was here a few days and then he died as the son of God. No, but he was born as a baby and he lived and he lived an exemplary, perfect life. So before he died for us, he was perfect. He lived for us before he died for us. And so the lamb of God was perfect. Was, the, the lamb had to be perfect and so Jesus was perfect he's the only one that qualifies he's the only one and that's Jesus he's the lamb of God and he's the perfect lamb of God who believes that this morning and uh, there's, there's some scriptures there in Peter it talks about well Jesus the perfect lamb of God so it had to be perfect and then secondly the lamb and this is a really important point the lamb had to be something personal what do you mean personal? Well, let's have a look in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 3 and verse 6. It says, tell Exodus chapter 12 verse 3 and verse 6. Next one. It says, tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, month each man is to take a lamb for his, for his family, one for each household, on the 10th day of the month, right? Verse 6, take care of them until the what? 14th day of the month when all the members of then when, when all the members of the community on Israel must slaughter them at twilight so they had to take this lamb this this passover lamb and they had to take it into their they basically took it into their homes and so for 4 days that lamb was to become an absolute part of their life had to bring them into their family. They would actually, in most cases, they would bring them actually into their home. Um, while they're eating their meal at night, the little lamby was there, you know, lying in its little whatever box in the corner. Um, and and th th it, there was an atmosphere. Th there was a, there was a, it was very much, it was close to them at night. And how many of you know when you bring a little, how many of you know when you bring, a little lamb into your house, how many know what happens? You start to love the lamb, am I right? You start to create emotional attachments. And so eventually this lamb would be in their house and the house would start to actually take on a bit of the smell of the lamb, which is a nice smell, incidentally. And it would take on, there would, there would be an, an, an atmosphere and their conversations were around the lamb. They, they were not separate from the lamb. The lamb wasn't just, you know, take it and just put it out in a room out the back and kind of wait for the day. No, no, no. They had to take it into their home and it very much became a part of their life. They didn't put it at arm's length. They didn't just go and visit the lamb on Sundays. They didn't just go to, to the petting zoo and visit the lamb and then leave it. They actually had to invite it into the very home, into the very family, and make it a part of their life. And that, for me, is an incredible picture of what the lamb still wants today. The lamb of God, Jesus, still wants to be the center of our very lives. He wants to be a part of our families. He wants to not to be just put to the outer, not someone who we may go and remember and visit one day a week or every so often, but we actually bring him in and we make him the very center and a part of our life. And there's a, we, we love the lamb. There's an attachment to the lamb. Who can see that this morning? I think that's an amazing picture. And you know, this morning we have the privilege of actually dedicating a baby who loves dedications bad luck if you don't because we're going to have one 
And uh, Jacques and Gabby Sardi here sitting down on the front with beautiful little Kovi Johannes Sardi. Did I say that right? How beautiful. Have, we're we're going to dedicate this little man to Jesus. And there's very much a sense with dedication um, it is, is that they're going to create a home. Listen to me very carefully. They're going to create a home where Jesus is present. That's, that's what dedication is. It's, we're going to try and create an environment and a home where Jesus is not just someone who's out there, but the lamb is someone who's a part of our life. He's a part of, there's not one part of our family he's not a part of. Some of you this morning say, well, I don't know, I don't have much, or we spend a lot of time trying to bring a whole lot of things to our family. Can I just say, mum and dad, one of the greatest things you can bring to your family is the lamb. It's the lamb. And dedication represents that. And so I want to make that a part of the sermon this morning. Is that all right? And so I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask Jacques and Gabby if you would come up and bring a little Kovi Johannes with you. Nikki, can you come up too, please, darling? Wonderful. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? Does, there it is. Even got an aisle from mum. So, I think this is an incredible picture to be able to have a dedication around. And as I said it's this morning, it's the dedication of parents. You know, we, we dedicate a child, but it's a dedication of parents to create a home that Jesus is not just someone out there, but the Lamb of God is a part of your life. And you invite him into every dimension of your life. You know, there's an integrity there. He's integrated. And, and I'm, I know that's your heart's desire. And I'm believing this morning that as you do that, God sees this. He sees your dedication. And so it's a dedication of parents to create <clears throat> that environment. But it's also a dedication of recognizing that Covey, I said that right? Cove or Covey? Cove. Just Cove. No, no E on the end, just Cove. Okay. Uh, Covey, Cove. Yeah. He gets Covey already? Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> that I know mum and dad you know why he's here but also God knows why he's here and before God created the heavens and the earth I believe he had Covey in his mind and he's, he's created with a purpose and a plan and so you're dedicating him that is you partner together with God to create a, a home that the lamb is in the centre of that in an age of understanding that this little man will get a taste for the lamb and he'll want to follow the lamb and he'll want to, he'll want to love Jesus like mum and dad do. Is that cool? So we're going to dedicate him this morning. And, uh, and you know what, church, also, as a church, we're dedicating ourselves to creating a spiritual family where the lamb is front and centre and that this is a church where children can grow up in, where they can taste and see that the Lord is good. Can I hear a good amen? And so it's a dedication of, of Gabby and Jacques, but it's also a dedication of us as a church family this morning to, um, I'll move this out of the way so you can see. Is that better? Wonderful. So I'm, can I take him? As in just for a moment. Quick, he's going to cry. <laughs> oh. You like him like that? Yeah. Here we go. Let's do it this way. Haven't quite lost my touch. Come on, just reach your hand out towards Kovi, Kov Johannes. Father, we thank you for this little life. Father, it's... It's not just a biog biological circumstance this morning, but, Father, life is given by God. And so, Father, we recognize that. We recognize your handprints, your design. 
And Father, we dedicate him this morning to your purposes. We thank you for him. Bless him today. Come on, let that cry go. He's agreeing with me already. Awesome. Father, we bless him today. We bless him. We dedicate him to your purpose. In Jesus' name. And Cove said. <laughs> Wonderful. His bottom lip is quivering. Come on, you hold him and I'm going to pray for you together. Come on, reach your hand out towards mum and dad. We're going to pray for them together. Father, we see their dedication this morning. And Father, I pray that you would bless this home. Father, together as Jacques and Gabby seek to create a home, an environment, Father, that has the atmosphere of the Lamb. Father, I pray that you would strengthen them, enable them. Father, I pray that you would bless them today. Lord, that this little man would be an incredible blessing to them. And that, Father, that through Jacques and Gabby, they would be, they would, you would be an incredible blessing to Cove. Father, we dedicate him today. Father, I pray for the strength of God, for the blessing of God to be upon them. Father, I pray when they're weak that you would be strong. Father, we commit them to you today. We commit this family. And Lord, as a church today, we, we as a church commit ourselves. We dedicate ourselves to helping to foster and create an environment where families can grow up in a place where they can taste and see that the Lord is good. So, Father, we thank you for them. We dedicate them and we dedicate this little man. And together as a family we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 There you go. Wonderful. Bless you guys. Bless you, Jack. How good was that? I think that's the first time I've ever included a dedication as a part of a message, but how fitting is that? Have Jesus, the Lamb, in your house as a part of your life. So it became personal. There was a, an emotional attachment. And so the lamb become valuable. How many can see God's purpose in that? That when they sacrificed the lamb, it wasn't just its value as a lamb, but there was, there was a connection there was something personal. And I believe this morning there needs to be something very personal about our response to the Lamb of God. Something very personal. So it was, it was, it had to be perfect and it had to be personal. But also then that Lamb, then after that, after having that Lamb for four days in their house with them, with an atmosphere of the Lamb in the house, they then had to sacrifice that Lamb. They had to sacrifice the lamb. In verse 6, it says, Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Now, this is a little bit adults only, I know. But Easter is very much that way. And the key word there is, is the word Slaughter. On the cross, Jesus just wasn't killed. Jesus was slaughtered like a lamb. And it's interesting that God chose in the whole timeline of history, God chose a time for his son to be delivered into the world when capital punishment was at its worst and at its most brutal. Isaiah the prophet, some 600 years or so before Looking ahead, he, he said in Isaiah 53, describing, he saw the cross, he said he was, he was pierced, Isaiah 53, 5, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, he was punished, the punishment that was bought, that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. And so he was pierced, he was crushed, he was punished, and he was wounded. So they first, they, 
They took Jesus after he, they'd sentenced him to the cross. They took him and tied him up to that whipping post. And there those guards, those Roman guards, they whipped him. 39 was the law because 40, they, often, they, they knew they would not live beyond 39 and they would whip them. And the whip just wasn't a, a single whip, but it had, it was like the cat of nine tails, if you like. It had many, multiple strands on it. It had bits of rock and clay um, and, and, and bone stitched into it, sewed into it. And it was soaked in water, so they were heavy. And then it wasn't like something that was like a two-handed job. And they would they would, they would flog their back and those, those bits of stone and those bits of, of clay and that would stick in their, into their flesh and then it would be ripped out and it would actually bring with it flesh as they would, they would whip Jesus at the post. And so for those 39 lashes, 13 of them roughly would go on, on, across the trapeze muscles up there and then another 13 on the other side and then another 13 down the spine which basically left them with an exposed spine and with the trapeze muscle torn from their back almost so that their shoulders were not held it was a it was a slaughter it was something that was incredibly brutal and there they took them down off that whipping post and they took him into the praetorium uh, which was like the room where the guards would hang it was like their, their 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 guard room and there they blind and they basically he was just there at their disposal and they would they blindfolded him and, and beat him and said you know who who hit you prophesy and they spat upon him and that whole time he never uttered a word and then they took that crown of thorns and they pressed it in upon his forehead. I love what that scripture says. He was the punishment that was brought upon him was for our peace. He suffered in his mind. He suffered in his head so that we could have peace in ours. Who believes that this morning? And so the crown of thorns was pushed into that head. And then, then after that, he would have to then carry that cross. And we know the struggle that was and how he collapsed. And then uh, another man come and helped him carry for that last bit. Uh, but, but, but the weight of that cross, he had to carry it up to the mountain of Golgotha. And then the nails were put through, uh, through their, their wrists, they tell us, not just their hands, because the weight of their body would tear out of their hands. And they would put those big old spikes through their wrists and then they would put their legs, cross their legs over and put a, a big spike right through with their knees slightly bent. And there was a reason for that. They would put a big spike right through their foot into that old wooden cross. And then they would, be, they would stand that cross up and it would fall into the ground or fall in place. And then they were crucified. They were then crucified. And then the only way you could breathe was that you had to then push up on your legs because of the weight upon your lungs your shoulders had no strength because of the the flesh that had been torn and every time you breathed you would have to try and push up on your legs that's why they used to break their legs when death was to make sure that death would come quickly and so Jesus of course they, his legs whenever when it come time for six hours for six hours Jesus hung on that cross for six hours he hung on that cross <gasps> trying to breathe trying to breathe trying to push himself up I tell you that's why I'm saying to us this morning we harken back to last week we can never have a lukewarm response to Jesus I could never have something that's just a a, a yawn and a, it's, I can't give Jesus a lukewarm response. I either disbelieve that he died for me or I, am, I, I, I give him my life and I give him my all. He's the saviour that died. He was the lamb that was slaughtered on the cross. And then they got that spear and plunged up into that cavity. And the Bible says blood and water flowed and there's a whole lot of ideas as to why that was. But the bottom line is Jesus, the lamb, wasn't just killed. He was slaughtered. No wonder he's called the lamb of God, the sacrificial lamb. So he was, the lamb was, had to be perfect. And then the lamb had to become a part of your life. It had to be personal. And then that lamb, that, that lamb was then slaughtered. Its blood was spilt. But then they had to do something else with the lamb. They had to then, after they'd slaughtered the lamb, what would they do? They would, they would prepare it, and then they had to share it. They actually had to share the lamb. Look what it says in verse 4. It says, so Moses said, this is what the Lord says. Sorry, wrong chapter, verse 4. If any household is too small for a whole lamb... 
They must share, everyone say share, one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You're to share the land. I said the lamb, the whole idea of the lamb is a picture. And this is such a pertinent picture for us today. It's a picture of now. And that is that we are to share the lamb. The lamb is for sharing. You had to share the lamb. It was, they, they could not leave any of the lamb, so you couldn't just waste any of it. It all had to be divvied out so that there was, um, the whole lot of it was consumed. And the whole idea was that the whole lamb had to be consumed and so therefore it had to be shared. You had to invite others in to partake of the lamb. Can I just say this morning, there's plenty of lamb to be shared. There's plenty of lamb to be shared. My Bible tells me in John 3.16 that God so loved the few. That God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him. There's lots of lamb. You know, and I took time over this this morning, but there's nothing in me that desires this church to be big or grow for big sake. There's nothing in me, as far as I can tell, that that is associated with a personal desire that somehow my self-worth is found in that or, or ego that's attached to that. The reason that I believe we always need to be making room for more is because there's lots more that need to taste the lamb. There's lots more that need to taste the lamb. The lamb of God needs to be shared. One of the key reasons we planted the church at at Tigham was so that more people could have the opportunity of tasting the lamb of the lamb to be shared. We want to make sure, we want to, you know, here at Chermside, we want to make sure that there's a table not just set for you, but there's a table to set of all those who would like to come, for all those who you would like to bring. You know, our, our job, it's found in, in, one, in 2 Corinthians 5.19. It says, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Aren't you glad about that this morning, church? And he's committed to who? To us, the message of reconciliation. People need to be able to know about the Lamb. And so even this week, we've been having conversations in our staff. It's like, how do we wait make room for people? And not, not just because we've got nothing better to do, but for the simple reason is we want to make room for people to encounter and experience the Lamb. That's why we run Alpha. That's why people give up good time. Why? Because we want people to encounter the Lamb. That's why we run a children's ministry. Because we want our kids to taste and see that God is good. That's why we have a youth ministry, because we want a generation of kids growing up who would never have heard about the Lamb before if it wasn't for CPY on Friday nights and kids that have come from that school. They're finding out, they're hearing that the Lamb is being shared, church. That's why we want to encourage people to open up their homes and to make space for people so that other people can encounter and experience the Lamb and have fellowship together around the Lamb. So as a church, you know, look around you this morning. We're pretty full. So we're having conversations about how do we make space? How, what, do we add another service? When, how, what, why? What do we do? Father, you're, you're giving the increase. Father, people are coming, but we want to make room for more so that other people can hear and experience and, be share, and, and have an encounter with the Lamb. Who believes that this morning? What else are we here for? 
So we do lots of things for other people to encounter the Lamb outside of these. And you're a big part of that. You, the church has gathered this morning, but you scatter and you go and, and, and you share the Lamb. And, and we, we empower partners in, in lands overseas and in places around the world where we partner with people to, people to share the Lamb. Thank God for all those partners. But here, this church is also a mission. And so we need to be always making space so that we can set the table, so that we can create a feast, because we want people to encounter and experience the the lamb it's a sign of a church that understands that that makes room that goes out of its way that's that's why we say you know and it comes out in that that's the spiritual dimension if you like but the practical dimensions and sometimes we can we cannot we can ignore the practical dimensions because somehow well it's just practical but none of the practical becomes very spiritual and that's why we say, look, if you can possibly park off-site, you know, so we can make space for elderly or, or people or the new or whatever, p- help us out by doing that. It's not about our, our rights, about who's, who's first in, first par- best car park. And that's why we encourage the worship team. They arrive here early before any of us. They all park off-site. They all park at Red Radiology. They all, well, it's not called that anymore. Um, or they park at the child care centre. The reason we do that is why? Because we want to make room. We want to make space. We want to create a table. Who's with us this morning? And so please consider that. And so be praying for us as we look and say, Father, how do we how do we make room? Not so that we can pat ourselves on the back and go, it's got it's got nothing, to, it's got everything to do with people encountering and the lamb being shared. The lamb being shared. Who wants to be a part of sharing the lamb, church? And so this is a part of preparing us for Easter. We prepare ourselves personally because that has a very personal ramifications. Aren't you glad that sometime, someplace, someone shared the lamb with you? And we, we consider our own hearts, we consider our own lives. But can I just say we're leading up to Easter. Easter is one of the most, uh, most obvious and one of the most responded to um, responses that people will respond to coming to an Easter service before almost any other. You ask someone to come to church uh, with you at any other time. Um, I forget what the stats are, but something like about 10 to 15 percent of people go, oh, yeah, "Yeah, okay." But if you invite them to an Easter service, the response, the percentage goes up exponentially. Why? Because some people go, oh, "It's Easter, I'll come." And so, as a church, we have an incredible opportunity for people to actually taste and see that God's Son Jesus is good. We have an opposite opportunity as a church to share what Easter, the Easter story is all about, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so, church, let's prepare ourselves because I'm telling you, all those services, we will give an opportunity for people to taste the lamb for the first time. And we can be a part of that, making space for that, helping to set the table for that when it comes our Easter services. What do you say? So, church, I, I want you to be considering that I want you to there, there's there's some ways in which you can respond I want you to pray so how many of you know that the prince of this the prince of this world has blinded people's eyes to their need oh I want you to pray that people's eyes would be opened I want you to pray pray for this coming Easter that people's eyes would be open I, I want you to invite people I want you to actually consider inviting people say hey listen would, would you come with me to our Easter Sunday service or, or Good Friday service but would you come and, and be a part of the inviting process, but also participate. Whatever is normal for you on a Sunday. I said last week, you know, worship is for God, but how many know that worship is for others as well? People are impacted by, uh, when we see people worshipping God sincerely, um, people realise His worthiness. And so let's, whatever is normal for you, just take it up a level. What do you say? And let's participate. Let's participate together. Let's, let's be on a team helping to make this church the kind of church that you want to bring your friends to with a confidence and the kind of church that people will come to. Yes, Russell.